Hi, and welcome to this overview of research in social sciences. Uh, specifically today, I'll be focusing on the research that I do uh, as a way of an introduction to you about how research uh, is approached in the social sciences, including the uh, methodologies we use, such as field work, participant observation, and also talking a little bit about the publications that I do, and at the end, some of the video work that I've begun uh, to supplement my research um, in some new and, and more experimental senses. Uh, so my name is uh, Scott Lucas. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training. I also do work in uh, sociology and cultural studies. I've taught in uh, two departments where I teach uh, sociology and anthropology, and I tend to think that those two um, disciplines go well together as part of the, the broader social sciences. If you take a sociology class with me or an anthropology class with me, Indeed, you might see some overlap, and I think that's just the, the nature of the beast in terms of thinking about how anthropology and sociology work together. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about then um, some of the research I do outside of my, my primary areas, and then get back to my primary research, which is in themed and immersive spaces. Um, so I had the opportunity years ago, uh, more in the realm of sociology and, and criminology, to co-edit a collection with uh, Dr. Stuart Henry, who teaches at uh, San Diego State University, Recent Developments in Criminological Theory. This comes um, into play if you take my Crime and Society class, the SOC 106, where I get into some of my um, emphases in terms of crime and society. Specifically, I like looking at consumer issues and the politics of crime, as well as some um, urban issues and, and crime. So this is an edited collection, and what it means is that um, we didn't necessarily write everything in this. Uh, it's a lot of previously produced materials, and then we wrote an introduction for it. Um, likewise, a different type of edited collection uh, is this one here that I did with John Marmich, who teaches at the College of Marin. He's a, a philosopher and specifically studies existentialism. And we met years back at a uh, NEH summer seminar at Stanford University that was uh, dedicated to the work of Hannah Arendt and the origins of totalitarianism, which is one of her uh, great epic books. And we were just talking uh, at a coffee hour and said, hey, you know, we, we, we share this interest in film remakes. So we produced this edited collection. When you do an edited collection, it basically means that you um, ask people to write papers or chapters for you. So we have a series of authors who wrote for us. Um, we each also wrote a chapter. Um, this particular book deals with film remakes and specifically within the realm of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror uh, film remakes. John wrote on uh, his interest in uh, the two versions of Rollerball. I did a chapter on uh, zombie films, everything from George Romero to Resident Evil to um, some of the video games out there as well. And then we collaborated on an introduction. The introduction typically tries to weave together the different um, contributors, what they're offering in the book. And it's often a challenge to do because even though you go into it with some common premises or foundations in terms of film remakes and what we have to say about them, it's often hard to, to make those kinds of connections as you, as you weave together the, the various authors. So this was a book that we did um, a few years back. And then um, lastly, kind of in, in the areas a little bit more outside my primary research, I worked with uh, Patricia Rice, David McCurdy years ago in uh, this book called Strategies in Teaching Anthropology. And this was part of a group that we had um, been participating in for years at the AAA or American Anthropological Meetings in Washington, D.C. And um, this particular book then is a series of teaching strategies relative to anthropologists who teach uh, or who try to come up with new methods of teaching concepts in the classroom. So this is very much focused on pedagogy or the theories of education and how to achieve better education in the classroom. So those are um, some books I've done at different years, different time periods, different purposes. My primary research focuses on themed and immersive spaces. And um, to explain that a little bit, actually, this was my first book that I did of any sort. It's what we call also an edited collection. And this is called The Theme Space. And like the film remakes book, this is focused on trying to get people, different authors um, from different disciplines, not just the social sciences, but many other disciplines, to come together and to produce work that um, connects to this overarching theme. A theme space basically is um, a, a place that has a particular approach to it. If you go to Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Strip, and you see the Paris Las Vegas 
That's a themed casino. And the idea there is that it's themed in accord with Paris or France. And uh, so the idea behind this book was to say, how are different people around the world approaching the study of theme spaces in, in various um, senses, ranging from China to South Africa to the United States to many other places. And it was interesting working on this book because on uh, two occasions we had the, an opportunity to get authors together and to collaborate um, in, in further respects at um, meetings of the uh, American Anthropological Association. So it was a cool opportunity to get people together and to have some additional dialogue after the fact, after we produce this edited collection. I should also say that this book, um, my, I have a chapter at the end that deals with my um, dissertation research, really. So kind of to give you a lowdown on that, I, was, um, I got my PhD at Rice University in Cultural Anthropology. And I happened to take a summer job at, uh, as an, an employee trainer in the service industry at a Six Flags theme park called Six Flags Astroworld. That park has since closed, but that um, work where I was a trainer and I trained employees on the day-to-day -day service issues, that work then became the subject of my dissertation. Um, and there were other issues I dealt with as well. So I had the opportunity, since I never published a full monograph on my dissertation, to write a little bit about that research. If you're curious, you can actually download some of these books, some of them in their entirety. You can watch some videos. Um, and I'll, I'll try to show you my um, up here, my academia.edu page. And that way, if you want to read some of my research, if, if you're interested, you can go there and actually read a PDF free of charge. Um, so that was a theme space and actually my first uh, official book. And that led to an opportunity um, I had proposed to uh, Reactions Books. And they do um, some really phenomenal work. They're based out of London. And they do a whole series called the Object Series, which deals with key architectural objects or even technological objects. They did a book prior to this one called Airport. They did one called Bridge. Um, and so I had proposed uh, a concept. I said, hey, what about doing theme park as a concept? Um, they liked it. We went back and forth and, and eventually came up with this um, uh, title. Now, and, and, and there's a lot to say about that back and forth thing. When you do a book proposal or a proposal for an edited collection, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work that you do anywhere between 10 and 20 pages of writing, um, talking about what the book is about, outlining um, all the chapters, discussing previous books on the subject that have been written, getting into marketing issues, for example, how will the book sell? Does it have a potential to be used in college classrooms? Will it be a trade publication more like this one and so forth? And that's very important because what happens is the publisher and the editor that you work with, and sometimes we call them acquisition editors, they actually acquire the book, they work on you with a proposal, and then you go on to a managing editor who gets into the nuts and bolts of actually producing it. Uh, the book itself. And it could be the same person, just, just kind of depends on your press. And so after this rather long process going back and forth, when you actually um, have a book a proposal, you're given a contract, in some cases you get a small uh, advance, it may not be a lot of money, it's nothing like, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama writing their books where they get million dollar advances or something like this. Nothing on that level. And I should say that I often joke with students that you're, you're not necessarily going to, uh, to get rich writing um, books like these. Um, the theme space, as an example, one year I remember getting a royalty check of a whopping $4.20. So figure that out. Um, that's basically maybe one fancy drink at Starbucks. Um, but a lot of us do this work not because we want to make any money, but because we want to present our ideas to a bigger audience, a wider audience. We want to have exposure and to hopefully get feedback as we do social scientific work. Other researchers then can comment on the work I'm doing and vice versa. So it's an opportunity for great collaboration. But getting back to theme parks, so this particular book was a book that had a lot of images, so that was something interesting. I had to work on acquiring the images. If they didn't have public domain rights and so forth, I had to get permissions, I used stock photos. In one case, there was a photo I wanted for a very specific purpose near the end of the book, and I had to pay a couple hundred dollars for that. So it, it tells you that if you're doing a book where there's photos, you sometimes have to think about how you're going to fund um, your photo permissions and so forth. And that itself can be a, a lot of work. Now, what was cool about Theme Park was that 
it was a book written for a more broader audience. It was not written necessarily just for academics. So I had the opportunity to play around a little bit, moving beyond my traditional approaches that I focused on, say, in that previous edited collection of theme space. The other kind of cool tidbit about this was a few years after it was published, um, I found out they wanted to do an Arabic translation. So you could actually see they did that. And I had nothing to do with the actual translation. There was a translator. Um, and if you, if you look um, at the book, actually, on the inside, you occasionally will see um, a word that isn't translated and it's just in English. And, and it also is, you flip the pages the opposite way that, that we do in um, English uh, texts. And so um, this was, you know, kind of cool to see that there was an opportunity to do a translation for one of my books. And first and only time that's, that's actually happened. Um, now, after I did Theme Park, a couple years uh, after that, I, I wanted to work on um, more practical applications of my work. And you kind of see a, an arc here where I go from more abstraction to um, less abstraction to more applied work. And I think it's just a natural progression for some of us who do research. If you do um, applied sociology or if you do work in um, more postmodern or reflexive anthropology, you're getting into this terrain where you're actually focusing on what's called practice or praxis, to use the German term, as opposed to theory. So we're moving from abstraction to more practical or applied context. And I think that's important personally. As we get into social anthro in your class, you might want to think about that. How can you actually apply what you're learning in these classes to your own lives, to your own everyday context? So actually what happened was I was approached by a publisher uh, Focal Press, they're part of the big conglomerate Elsevier, and they do a lot of guidebooks. And so if you look at Focal, you'll see books on Photoshop, you'll see video editing, um, all kinds of interesting books. And they approached me with this idea. They wanted to do a book on architecture. And I'm not entirely sure how they learned about my research, um, but they did. And we went back and forth, as I said, that process of talking to the editor and collaborating. And eventually we came up with this idea, the Immersive Worlds Handbook, Designing Theme Parks and Consumer Spaces. So this is a book also that's loaded with pictures, which was, was kind of fun to do this. Um, a lot of charts as well. And I did a series of interviews. Um, one of the things the editors said is, you know, you're not necessarily as um, immersed in the world of um, uh, theme design and architecture. So could you interview some folks in the field? And that was a great opportunity, actually, to work with some people then. And I should say some of these people I'm still working with today, doing conference papers, doing publications together. So it's another thing we're trying to do in social sciences. If you work on something like this and you collaborate with one, two, or three people, down the road, you're going to work with those people as well. Uh, it reminds me of a previous world. I used to be a music major before I majored in the social sciences. And one of the things that happens in music, you might know if you play an instrument or perform, is if you work with one set of musicians, that opens up opportunities to work with other folks, other musicians, other networks as well. It's the same thing in publishing and research. And I think it's an incredible way to open up new horizons and vistas for collaboration with other researchers. So this was a cool project because it was so applied and so practical and focused. Um, it was an attempt also to say, if you're designing your own themed immersive spaces, what are some practical things that you can do? And so that was really the focus of this, this particular book. And the focus was not on the theoretical and analytical side, but more on the applied side of designing these actual spaces. Um, right before I did this work, and it was influenced by this a little bit, I had an opportunity to consult for Walt Disney Imagineering and do some work for them. I've done some other consulting work as well. So a lot of that work actually where I was sitting down thinking about how can I work with these really high level, super qualified Imagineers who design the latest attractions and theme parks around the world, like uh, the new Avatar stuff you're seeing in, in 2017 in, in, at Walt Disney World and the Animal Kingdom actually. Um, how, how can I work with these people because they already have such a, a practical and applied focus and an incredible knowledge base. So I had to really work on that and that work then involved um, sitting down and outlining, uh, outlining a lot of things for the seminars I did with them. And then some of that became the source material for the Immersive Worlds Handbook. So again, sometimes our work has unexpected foundations or sources and we take it in new directions. And I very much would say it's akin to an improvisation. If you think about improvisation, um, it of, uh, often has this level of you start with one theme or idea and then you work with that and you 
change and alter it and, and work in, into another entirely different direction. Um, so the last thing, or the latest thing I should say, is an entirely new edited collection that came out just this last year, and it's called A Reader in Themed and Immersive Spaces. Um, this is a press, um, ETC Press, out of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And one of the interesting things about this book is that um, you can actually buy the printed book, and I think they did a very nice job. Um, this is another story about getting images, but I had a, a very nice postcard of a World Expo, uh, and I used that then as the cover, and the designers at the press did a wonderful job with the font and um, doing the color and, and layout and so forth. And um, you know, overall, I think they did a really cool job on this book. But the cool thing about this is you can actually download, and I'll give you the, the source, you can look at it, um, but it's available um, open source, so you can read the entire book if you want, and you can have an opportunity to see some of the research I do, and also some of the collaborators who worked with me on this book and the research they do. And this particular book, um, like the earlier one, The Theme Space, has, uh, this one is, is pretty massive. It's uh, over 350 pages long and has 30 chapters. I've written a number of these, um, and then um, other authors have written about um, topics ranging from uh, the Titanic uh, Belfast exhibit to um, uh, looking at uh, themed attractions, such as the Game, Game of Thrones at, uh, attractions, um, the Lost City in um, South Africa, many different topics here. I won't try to go through all these, but it's really cool, again, to collaborate on this because you're getting so many voices and so many different perspectives other than your own. I should say that for um, tenure purposes at big universities, a lot of times tenure committees um, don't like edited collections for one reason or another, but I think they're actually marvelous because you have opportunity, opportunities for collaboration that you wouldn't normally have if you're writing your own monograph. And so an edited collection, I think, is a great opportunity to think about some issues in new ways for the simple fact that you're working with other researchers and they're challenging your perspectives and, and your approaches. Um, so those are the books I've written. And again, um, not every um, you know, book I've written necessarily uh, relies on you know, all of the research methods that I typically use or involve in, in my everyday work. Um, I do a lot of participant observation, so that means direct everyday experiences and a lot of note-taking, a lot of video um, uh, taking, um, using my sound recorder in the field to do interviews and so forth. Um, but there's also just a lot of um, what we call cultural analysis that we do in textual analysis. So sometimes we're working with primary texts, we're getting on the internet, we're researching blog sites. I, I'm all over social media in terms of the research I do in themed and immersive spaces, watching videos, looking at movies. I was just recently watching the new um, Westworld adaptation or remake um, that was done by HBO, which I think has some interesting uh, approaches and points. And I'll be using that eventually in another video I'm doing for some research on looking at the front and backstage dynamic in, in service industry spaces, including theme parks. So. Um, there's a lot of varied research that I do, not just uh, participant observation, as I look just here, some of, some of my notes. Um, the other thing I should say is that when we write, we're always writing for an audience. Um, I do a lot of other work beyond this. These are the books that I have a direct part of, but I'm also a part, a smaller part of other books that other authors or academics write, where I contribute a chapter or two, or I do an interview, or I do a book review, or even an encyclopedia entry. And in those cases, I'm writing for a much different audience. And so my approaches, whether it's the research I do in the field or how I write it from a perspective, do I use a reflexive voice, such as saying, I believe, versus a third person voice, where I'm being more neutral and detached. All of those sorts of decisions that you do as an author, as a researcher, very much depend on your audience. And I think we often forget this. We assume everything we write has the same approach, has the same narrative style, has the same methodological fieldwork foundations. That's false. You're always writing for an audience, and it's very important to think about that when you're doing um, the, the writing, when you're doing the initial impetus stage of doing the foundations and thinking about outlining it. And then when you're actually doing the writing itself, of course, you're going to make some decisions there. When you're doing the research, you're also making key decisions about it. So writing for an audience. And the last thing I wanted to say about my research today is that I'm very recently trying to do much more with multimedia. So the video you're watching today 
is part of some new work I'm doing. Um, I have a YouTube page, which I'll list here, that is, is primarily focused on my themed and immersive space research. And that is trying to, to get you to look at the practical everyday issues of any of the spaces that I, I visit. I try to travel as much as I can, whether it's Berlin or Singapore or the Las Vegas Strip or various theme parks or world expos that happen to be uh, taking place. And uh, the, the goal of that then is to video document what I'm seeing in the field, present it back to you with some analytical issues, and then offer that as an upload to my YouTube page. So if you want to check some of that out, um, you certainly can do that. It's a great opportunity, I think, to see something beyond the textual stuff that I'm doing here. The other thing I should say is that um, I also have done research in the past on gender and consumer culture, uh, specifically the world of advertising. And it's a website I've curated over the years called the Gender Ads Project. Um, I haven't had as much time to do anything new with the site recently. One of the things that when you're doing research in different um, domains or areas, you're pulled in multiple directions. And everyone is limited in terms of their time. I am, you probably are as well. So sometimes you have to let one project go to the back burner a little bit and just focus on your primary research. And that to some extent has happened with my gender ads project. And who knows, maybe in a couple years I'll pick it back up and work on it. But if you've done any web development work where you curate things and you collect images and, and so forth as I do on the site, you know that that's very labor intensive as is working on YouTube sites and doing videos and, and so forth. Um, so that is some of my research in a nutshell. I hope it gives you a little bit of context and if you're taking the class uh, for the first time with me, whether it's sociology or anthropology, you get some insights about where I'm coming from. Um, if you're interested in any of the areas I've talked about, we can have a conversation outside of the typical uh, classroom frame and maybe have some interesting dialogues about some of these uh, areas of interest if we, if we share some of them in common. So good luck in your class and I hope you have the opportunity as I've done over the years to apply uh, social sciences to your own lives and also to everyday situations that you might encounter. So good luck with the class and I'll see you back on some additional videos here in anthropology and sociology.